welcome, uh, welcome everybody um, to the, the continuation of MSSR today. Um, we are joined by Hannah Note, who's going to be uh, lecturing to us today about Russia and the Middle East. Um, and I'll do a quick little introduction and then pass the microphone over to her. Um, I just got a lot to talk about. Um, Hanna Note is a senior research associate at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation, where she focuses on Russian foreign policy in the Middle East, uh, <clears throat> weapons of mass destruction, arms control, and nonproliferation in the Middle East and Russia West relations. Uh, she previously served as a non resident scholar with the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies um, and as a senior political officer with the Sheikh Group a nonprofit uh, consultancy focused on track two diplomacy and conflict mediation in the Middle East. She supported the organization's engagement with Russia related to the Syria track two dialogue initiative and also worked on other track two dialogues related to the broader region. An, uh, Hanna holds a DPhil in international relations from the University of Oxford. Uh, we have a bunch of University of Oxford folks on the call here uh, and as part of uh, MSSR 2021. Um, where she also received an MPhil in 2014. She spent a year between 2015 and 16 in Moscow on an Alpha Fellowship with the Institute of Oriental Studies and the Carnegie Moscow Center. Um, other visiting research positions have included IS, IISS's Middle East office in Banama, Bahrain, and the Konrad Adenauer Foundation's Syria Iraq office in Beirut, Lebanon. Anna holds a BA in Social and Political Sciences from the University of Cambridge and worked at Goldman Sachs London offices as a strategic equity analyst from 2010 until 2012. She's lectured on Russian foreign policy in the Middle East, including at the Higher School of Economics uh, in Moscow and the American University of Paris and the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, um, and is regularly invited to speak at international events and conferences on the subject. She is a German national who speaks Russian, Arabic, and French. And last but not least, uh, she is one of our most famous alumna of the MSSR, uh, the, the Monterey Summer Symposium on Russia. So please give a warm MSSR 2021 welcome to Hannah Nenote. Thank you, Jarlus. Can everyone hear me fine? I was just going to say it's really uh, exciting to be back for, I suppose, my fifth MSSR year. So I was in the first cohort as a student at the time, as I was finishing my PhD uh, in 2016, 2017, I suppose, 2016, and have been, no, 2017, Jarlath, right, was the first year. Yeah, and 2017. have been lecturing um, ever since. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here um, and join you in what I understand is your last week. Um, as Jarlath mentioned, and thank you for the kind introduction, I've worked on Russia Middle East issues for the last eight years, I'd say, in my MPhil and DPhil, and then in Track 2 diplomacy subsequently for about three years, and now in the think tank world for the last year or so. Um, and I know that you have heard uh, really great lectures on Russian foreign policy more generally, by Professor Tsigankov, by Dmitry Trenin, uh, later you hear Professor Legwald, I believe. And so what we want to do today and tomorrow is focus on Russian foreign policy in one specific region, the Middle East and North Africa, or so-called MENA region, as sort of one geographic area where, of course, Russia has been very active in recent years. And the goal is really to look at the, the what. What does Russia want in that region? So what are its interests today and the how tomorrow? How does Russia go about achieving its aims? Is there a strategy? What are the tactics? Um, and to be able to answer the question ultimately, to what extent what Russia is doing in the Middle East is opportunistic, ad hoc, reactive versus you know, strategic. Is it driven more by security or more by economic considerations? And really an important question, to what extent is it just a derivative or a bargaining chip of Russia's broader relationship with the West? Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to pinpoint or to recognize some of the broader drivers of Russian foreign policy that you would have discussed in previous weeks. Uh, and, and you would see those reflected in what Russia is doing in the Middle East as well. Um, so let's get started. Um, 
What I want to do first is say a few words about how we should situate Russia's MENA policy, MENA stand, standing for Middle East and North Africa, within Russia's broader foreign policy. And I think the first thing to say here is that there's really little focus on the Middle East in official Russian strategic uh, documents. If you look, for instance, at the 2016 foreign policy concept, um, that provides only scant mention of the Middle East region, uh, mostly in the context of counterterrorism and counterproliferation. And I'd say the th same thing is true for the recent, recent Russian national security strategy that came out a, a few weeks ago, which really only mentions, I think, the Middle East once in the whole document. And so if you compare that to sort of post-Soviet countries, Russia-West relations, even China, the Middle East is not mentioned a whole lot in strategic documents that are put out by Russia. But I think that stands somewhat in contrast to the de facto growing significance of that region to Russian foreign policy in recent years. I mean, if you think about it, Russia went into Syria in 2015. It is now very active in Libya. Any conflict file in the region, whether it's Israel, Palestine, Libya, um, Gulf issues, Russia has a seat at the table. Um, if you look at diplomatic activity by the Russian foreign ministry and look at certain statistics, it's quite interesting. I think Kommersant published some numbers last year and it showed you know, that Lavrov's meetings or engagement, which were counted as in-person meetings and telephone calls with leaders or, or politicians from the MENA region had really doubled if you look at the period 2010 to 2015 and then 2015 to 2020. So, I mean, I sort of scroll through the Russian foreign ministry sort of news update on a daily basis. And there's almost always a couple of meetings that Russian diplomats hold with people from the region. Um, and I think that increased activity has to do with Russia's shifting foreign policy over the last decade. Um, or especially in the wake of, the, of uh, Crimea and the Ukraine crisis. And I guess that is also reflected in the national security strategy. How does Russia see the world? As increasingly multipolar, characterized by a rise of new powers, as a world that lacks moral leadership, where Russia sees itself in a protracted confrontation with the West, and where it believes that Russian sovereignty requires protection against Western attempts at undermining, isolating, containing Russia. And so in this unstable world that is in flux, the Russian leadership believes in the need to diversify its relations, pursue flexible alliance relationships that is also reflected in the foreign policy concept. And I think here, the MENA region occupies an important place in that new framework, really for two reasons. One is historical legacy. The Soviet Union was quite present in the region and it was an arena for competition with the US during the Cold War. You know, the Soviet Union had important relations, especially with Arab client states, Egypt, Iraq, Syria. But then also the second reason is that Russia went into Syria in 2015 and it is now capitalizing on that success. We'll come back to Syria a few times in, in these lectures. And you know that growing significance of Russia in the region has long been noticed by others, you know, uh, people sort of saying that Russia is back in the region um, if it ever was, was gone from the region. Um, and so having said that as a broad backdrop, I now sort of want to go into, well, what are Russia's interests in the region? And I think security interests do remain of paramount importance. Um, and here I really want to distinguish between two dimensions. The first historic interest that Russia has had or had, has associated with this region and that remains present today is to prevent basically the spillover of anything bad from the region to the Russian Federation or adjacent countries. When I say anything bad, I mean instability, extremism, terrorism, proliferation, centrifugal tendencies, um, you know, all of that. Um, I think especially in the context of the Syrian war, there was a heightened concern in Moscow, given how many foreign fighters went um, 
both to Iraq and Syria to join the jihad there. This is a slide, you know, I put together in 2016 when I was um, on my Alpha Fellowship in Moscow and I was supposed to look at who went from the post-Soviet space to Syria. Um, you know, it, was, it was literally two, three months after Russia had gone into Syria. And the numbers that people were talking about at the time, as you can see, were quite high. Um, 2,700 from the Russian Federation, and then another over 2,000 from Central Asia. A lot of these people presumably having recruited as labor migrants when they were actually in Russia. So, you know, that concern um, does not in, in and of itself explain Russian policy towards the Syrian war, but I think this concern that the region is quite close that Russia has a large Muslim community, that people can become radicalized and come back to the Russian Federation and pose a threat there, especially considering Russia's past experience with such threats uh, sort of remains a concern to this day. But overall, I want to say that when we talk about security as a driver and Russia trying to keep instability away from its borders, there are really multiple prisms or lenses through which Russia looks at the security situation. And I think it's, it's important to analytically distinguish between those because there's Russia's assessments of past Western and especially US policy towards the region, the way that Russian diplomats have looked at Iraq 2003, Libya 2011, or more broadly Western responses to the so-called Arab Spring. But then there's also Russia's own historical experience in the 1990s and subsequently uh, especially the Chechen wars. Uh, and then there is a concern with precedence of disorderly change being set in the Middle East that could serve as a model for post-Soviet countries. So there are different things going on here. And I quickly want to just go through those. So if you hear Russian diplomats talk about the Arab Spring, if we start with what I call the state order prism here, Russian diplomats account is usually that the Western response to the Arab uprisings was sort of social political engineering, that the way that Western countries responded to the Arab Spring meant an intrusion in the socio-political fabric of these countries because statehood in these countries was mostly very young, very fragile. You know, these leaders in these countries, yes, they were not perfect, but they somehow managed to maintain a fragile balance between different pillars, Islam, tribal relations, uh, manage to keep these often religiously and ethnically diverse societies together. And then when there was a demand for change, here comes the West and basically wants it all to go really quickly and radically, see rapid change. And that basically um, meant that this fragile balance in these societies was broken you know, Russian diplomats would say that therefore statehood was being destroyed in Iraq, in Libya, almost in Egypt. And to this day, these societies are massively struggling to put something stable together. Uh, I think there's sort of one quote that a Russian diplomat told me once in a conversation about Syria that really stuck with me to kind of encapsulate what I just said. He said to me, statehood in the Middle East is a very complex thing. It's like a Mercedes engine. It's, it might be easy to take it apart, but it's very difficult to put it together. This is kind of how they look at state order in the Middle East. And therefore, if you want change, it has to be incremental, slow change. You cannot dismantle existing institutions and think you can build something like a democracy there from scratch. Uh, then if you do that, you risk instability, fragmentation with all the attendant consequences like extremism and, and terrorism. So this is really what I mean here by the state order prism on this slide. Of course, the Libya experience was particularly formative for Russian diplomats, the way that they looked at uh, the you know, Security Council Resolution 1973 in March 2011, where famously under President Medvedev, Russia abstained and let that resolution pass and then sort of watched how uh, coalition forces eventually um, through the Gaddafi regime, which I think was a huge grievance to Russian diplomats at the time, and important to understand why they reacted in Syria the way that they did uh, subsequently. Um, and so again, coming to Syria then, I've, I mean, I've worked in track two diplomacy 
on the Syrian conflict for three years and I would often go to Moscow where we would bring ideas from the track two on the political process to try to convince Russian diplomats to take those ideas into account. And there was always a caution that we shouldn't rush to, to produce change or a sort of caution that if we go too far, if we push the Syrian regime too far, things could crumble and then that would be disastrous. Um, of course, um, I think you cannot understand this prism without taking into account Russia's own historical experience uh, without sort of wanting to elaborate too much on this. But after the Cold War, you had unrest among Russia's indigenous Muslim populations in the North Caucasus. There was a real worry that Chechen separatism could spill over into other regions. The second Chechen war was then really presented in the official narrative as a conflict fueled by, by outside forces that would seek to break up the, the Russian Federation. And I think um, this is important to understand how Russia would over a decade later look at, at events in the Middle East. It's also interesting to note that probably from the mid 2000s, I would say, the way that the Russian discourse has looked at changes in the Middle East, for instance, after the Cedar Revolution in Lebanon. So this is before the Arab Spring. They would mix this with their narrative on post-Soviet countries. So uh, around the Orange Revolution in, in Ukraine or the Rose Revolution in Georgia, you can already see hints in Russian discourse that would say, you know, Western forces are practicing regime change in the Middle East to develop blueprints to ultimately also exercise this in is sort of what we consider our sphere of influence. I think that linkage became much more acute later, but you see roots of it already in the mid 2000s. So I guess the bottom line here is, um, well, the bottom line here is that um, when we think about Russian core security interests in the Middle East, uh, you know, I, re I really want to stress that I see it as having two dimensions. You, you want to prevent regime change in the region because you genuinely believe that positive change is better produced through slow incremental change within existing orders. But you also want to prevent it because you don't want to see precedents being set that can become dangerous to Russia itself. Then there is a second security interest that has become more acute, I think, in recent years. And that has to do with using its presence in the region to counter threats from outside the region. So Russia has really used its military presence, especially in Syria, where you know, it has naval assets, a port in Tartus, uh, an air base in Khmeimim, and where it has deployed substantial military hardware and has expanded those facilities. Russia has increasingly used uh, that presence to project power militarily vis-a-vis -vis NATO um, and you know, has been able to push back militarily in the region, for instance, harassing US forces in Northeast Syria, or very recently after the HMS Defender, the UK ship, um, sailed towards Crimea, you might remember this a few weeks ago, the Russians deployed heavy bombers and MiG-31 um, fighter aircraft um, armed with Kinjal missiles to Syria for the first time um, in order to basically show if you, meaning NATO, do something elsewhere that is to our displeasure, we can push back in another region, the Middle East, where we have now a significant presence. Um, so that is perhaps not enough. And I did sort of have a slide here that shows the extended runway at Khmeimim. This is Khmeimim, the, the, the air base where you can see at the top that the runway was uh, recently extended. Um, I had a video on this slide, but the, the file got too big, so I had to delete it um, anyway. Um, Russia is basically also using its presence in the Middle East to complicate NATO operations and therefore deal with security issues outside the Middle East. And that is driven by you know, the, this, this desire to have a strong presence in the Eastern Mediterranean to deploy this anti-access and area denial uh, capability is again driven by this belief of a Western or NATO encirclement
um, just, uh, I mean, here you see sort of where NATO is present in and around the Mediterranean basin. Um, I think just one or two weeks ago, Lavrov was invited to speak at a webinar to delegates of United Russia. And he again expanded on this notion. He, I just, and here I just have a sort of coverage of that from Commerçant, what, what they were writing about it basically accusing Western nations of creating a belt of instability um, sort of surrounding Russia and quote unquote, he said, they want to absorb the territories around our country through various means and surround us with a buffer zone, additionally profiting from the fact that the West will have a decisive influence on the development of these countries. Um, so, so much for uh, Russia's security interests. I do want to come to Russia's economic interests, which I see as secondary. Um, and I'll say in a second why. Russia does, of course, seek commercial gains in the region. And this is, again, part of a sort of broader diversification of Russia's economic ties in the wake of introduction of Western sanctions after the annexation of Crimea. But I think the important thing to say here is that even though Russia has managed to increase trade with some of the countries in the region, you really got to see this in perspective. Overall, the MENA region makes up for only seven to nine percent in Russia's share of uh, foreign exports. Exports, actually, interestingly, uh, the significant portion of all that is with Turkey and Israel not with the Arab countries that used to be sort of the Soviet Union's most important partners in the region. Um, I think in 2019, Turkey overtook Italy as Russia's largest trading partner in the sort of med larger Mediterranean region. But even then, Turkey accounted for just under 4% of Russia's total trade. You know, in North Africa or Africa, even less of a sort of less significant here. I mean, Egypt and Algeria are noteworthy, um, especially Russian-Egyptian trade. But still, in terms of overall numbers for Russia, it's not that significant. And there has been a stagnating tendency in recent years. I mean, you see that here on the slide. I, I put the latest trade turnover numbers on the right. Of course, that's a bit unfair because those significant drops um, from 2019 to 2020 year on year are probably driven by the pandemic to some degree as well. But at the bottom of the slide, you still see that there's a sort of stagnating tendency that this is not something that is suddenly um, um, increasing in, in significance sort of qualitatively. And what's the reason for that? Well, the reason is that the structure of Russia's economic exchange with the MENA region is fairly simple and primitive because there's not that much that Russia and that region want of each other. I mean, Russia exports some energy products, metals, foodstuff. Um, it imports fruit, uh, textiles, and vegetables from the region. But that Russia doesn't produce that much that countries in the region want. I mean, there are really two areas in which Russia is considered quite competitive. And those are arms sales and uh, civil nuclear technology. So I want to say a few words about those. Uh, starting with arms sales, this is, I think, a, a CIPRI overview in the bottom right, where you sort of see that Russia's main um, um, customers of arms are India and China, but then Algeria comes next. And overall, about half of Russian arms exports nowadays go to the MENA region. Um, so that's quite significant. Um, Six uh, billion US dollars um, or yeah, 50% of the overall export volume, according to Russian sources. And like, what does Russia sell to countries in that region? It sells air defense systems. I mean, the Pantsir, the S-300, the S-400, helicopters, uh, tanks. And it's really to countries like Iraq, Algeria, Egypt. Of course, then you have the S-400 saga with Turkey. That's important. And, and why do we see that? Well, uh, basically, countries in the region turn to Russia because their weapons are usually cheaper easier to use and just easier to get than American or Western weapons. The Russians don't have the same sort of onerous procurement rules or human rights considerations. 
a process through Congress like there is on the US side. So they usually sell faster and, and um, regional countries also use Russia as a bargaining chip. I mean, they don't always buy from Russia, but if they're able to say to the United States, well, we could also buy from Russia, then that is a bargaining chip that they use vis-a-vis -vis the US. I mean, especially uh, the Iraqis, for instance, when they, they would say, when their fight against the Islamic State was really heating up and they needed stuff quickly, the US wasn't there to deliver what was needed, and so they turned to Russia. And with some of these countries in the region, uh, you have the added factor that Iraqi military officers, Egyptian military officers, they were often trained during Soviet times. Military doctrine is Soviet to some extent. There's legacy relationships. People know how to use these Russian systems. So that has sort of added to that as well. But of course, in recent years, you know, the United States in the context of great power competition with Russia, including in the Middle East, has threatened to impose Katsa sanctions on those who buy Russian weapons. Turkey did it anyway. It was kicked out of the F-35 program. It is under Katsa sanctions now. There's sort of constant talk that one should impose those sanctions on Egypt, um, though that's a complex um, issue as to whether that would be wise or not. But of course, um, there are certain disincentives for countries to go and buy Russian arms. Um, let's turn to uh, nuclear technology. Um, I mean, Rosatom is a big uh, employer, I believe, for the Russian economy and a significant portion of their portfolio of foreign orders. Um, and uh, in the Middle East, I mean, it's really Turkey and Egypt where they're big players. They signed the contract with Turkey in 2010 to construct the Akuyu power plant, where I put something from the website on the slide here. And I think the first unit is supposed to be opened in 2023, just in time for the 100th anniversary of the Turkish Republic. And then Russia is also supposed to construct Egypt's first nuclear power plant. Uh, originally, that was supposed to have been done by 2026, but there are some rumors in recent weeks and some reporting in the Arab press that the Egyptians are allegedly unhappy with the Russian position on the Nile Dam dispute. So then they're saying it's going to be two years later, but other sources are saying it's not true. So it's it's one of those instances where things are evolving and one has to one has to wait and see. But Ross Atom has also signed MOUs with a lot of other countries uh, in the region. Now, another area that's kind of interesting to watch where Russia really tries to be a player is, uh, is when it comes to agricultural products and exporting wheat or barley to the region. I mean, Russia sells a lot of grain to Egypt. It makes up for a, a large portion of Egyptian grain imports and Egypt has a large and growing population. So this is not insignificant. The Russians have also tried to enter the Algerian market, for instance. And this is even something that's increasingly noted by Russian scholars. So look at the MENA region. I mean, I put this REAC report for you here in the corner on Russian-Egyptian relations. That talks about sort of prospects for agricultural diplomacy sort of going forward because the thinking is, well, this region, the MENA region, given climate change, given water shortages, you know, the, the struggle for food will be a real struggle of sort of in the medium to long term. And this is a niche that Russia can fill. So you see more and more people paying attention to this. But again, in terms of numbers relative to sort of the Russian economy, this is just sort of a drop in the water. Tourism is another interesting one to look at. I mean, Russian tourists love to go to Egypt and they love to go to Turkey. And um, when things happen, the consequences can be quite significant. So after the Russian-Turkish bilateral crisis in November 2015, you might remember that the Turks shot down this Russian fighter aircraft at the beginning of Russia's Syria campaign. There was a big crisis in Russian-Turkish relations. Russia imposed sanctions on Turkey and tourists stopped going. I think this really hurt the Turkish economy at the time. And again, with Egypt and Russian tourists going to Egyptian tourist resorts, this was kind of direct flights from Russia to Horgeda or other places were stopped 
after this Russian plane was shot down over the Sinai in October 2015. You might also remember that a lot of Russian um, passengers were killed. And basically, this has been in this ongoing saga in Russian Turkish, uh, Russian Egyptian relations that the Russians resume those direct flights to these airports. They have resumed flights to Cairo, but they're still not satisfied allegedly with um, airport security in some of those other locations. And this is really important for the Egyptians that Russian tourists come back. Now, another area I want to quickly say something about is the area of energy, because, of course, as uh, one of the largest producers of oil and natural gas in the world, Russia's economy is highly dependent on exporting those resources, but the MENA region itself is a fairly big competitor to Russia when it comes to exports to Europe and Asia. And so for that reason, what Russia has really tried to do is to partner and gain stakes and a foothold in various exploration, development, infrastructure projects in the region, Algeria, Lebanon, Turkey, uh, Iraq, Libya, um, calculating that at least this will give Russia some degree of influence over these countries' delivery decisions to Russia's traditional markets. Um, and of course, when it comes to energy, another thing to note here is that Russia is very interested in maintaining a working relationship with especially the Saudis, also the Emiratis in the so-called OPEC plus format, because that's critical to Russia to seek alignment uh, on oil production levels and market prices. And you might remember, I think it was earlier last year, earlier in 2020, when there was this spat between Russia and Saudi Arabia over oil price quotas at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And um, that you know, was quite significant. Um, a final thing I want to say on, um, on economic interest is that Russia really is not uh, a financial player in the MENA region. Its official development assistance, which is shown here on this slide um, with different uh, figures. I mean, the, the upper one is an OECD um, graph and the, the one at the bottom is from a REAC report, it really shows you that, you know, Russian development aid to the region is fairly minor. Of the countries listed at the bottom that receive aid, it's really only to Syria, which I sort of marked in the bottom right, that the Russians sort of show up as one of the top four or five donors of development assistance for others in the region, Yemen, the, the Palestinians, Lebanon, you know, Russia doesn't figure. Um, and that stands in contrast to the Soviet Union, which, you know, used to give a lot of development assistance to the region. But Russia has been more pragmatic and more kind of benefit oriented in its economic engagement um, with the region. What the Russians did in the early 2000s was to forgive some of the debt to the countries in the region. They wrote of Iraq's debt after the Iraq war. They wrote of Syria's debt. But that was mostly from a calculation that these countries were not going to be able to repay the Russians anyway. Um, so, I mean, really, Russia is not, um, doesn't give development assistance or foreign direct investment to the region. It's really the opposite. The Russians have been trying to attract mostly Gulf money, Gulf investment into the Russian economy with some degree of success in recent years. I mean, here, the, the Saudis, the Emiratis and Qatar stand out where, you know, some sort of really interesting developments um, can be observed if, if you want to go into that. I mean, the Saudis and the Emiratis in particular are investing quite heavily in Russian regions rather than just at the Russian federal level. And uh, Kadyrov has sort of cultivated his, his own ties with the Emiratis. And some consider the money that the UAE spends in various Russian regions to be really quite significant. Um, so much for economic interests. And then I just want to say um, something about status, which to me is linked to the security interest, but it's still worth sort of treating it separate. Because if you look at Russian activity in the region 
this desire to um, have a seat at the table at, you know, in terms of each and every conflict file that is being negotiated, being so active in Syria, Libya, Israel, Palestine, Gulf security, there is, of course, the security component to it that, you know, we've discussed. But I think there's also, um, it's almost, you could call it a pedagogical objective that Russia is pursuing. Uh, the narrative is always to educate the West, or in particular, the United States, about what are effective or legitimate ways to produce order and stability in the region, both intrastate, so at a societal level in an individual country, but then also when it comes to regional conflicts. And Russia is really trying to usually pose an alternative to a US or Western-led approach, um, thereby also reinforcing what I think it's, it's, it's broader narrative about declining US power, changing world order, that is of course meant to resonate beyond just the MENA region. And this is also linked to considerations of status. I mean, most Russian interlocutors that you would discuss Russian foreign policy in the Middle East with would say that, of course, you know, this is part of Russia being back or being a, a, a great power. Um, that's also why it needs its presence in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, a naval port, a military base, participate in, in all these mediation formats because Russia is a great power. And so it has to be reckoned with. Um, and I think um, the, the, the normative dimension of this sort of status posturing has also to some extent been supported by the Russian Orthodox Church, which has sort of supported Russian uh, discourse on, on the Middle East, um, where Russia has, is usually portraying itself as the power that defends not just state order, but also minorities, religious minorities, um, and so I think that is also sort of one important thing to keep in mind. Um, I want to say a few conclusions about um, Russian foreign policy in the Middle East and also what they mean for the West generally, for the United States in, in particular, before we sort of go into a discussion. And again, I want to say that what I've tried to do today is just lay out the interests Tomorrow, I want to talk more about what how Russia goes about um, meeting those interests. But regarding the conclusions, I think um, an important thing about Russia's economic activity in the region is that the Russians go about this in a really pragmatic way. Um, they will uh, use opportunities when they when they present themselves doing business with whoever is available, which comes from, um, you know, a place of relative economic vulnerability, I think, where you, you know, you're trying to diversify your economic relations. But it is also driven by this geopolitically uh, defensive logic, um, which I, I put you on the slide mandates a Russian export of So what I want to say with this is that often uh, what Russia does economically in the region reinforces its security interests. So Russia doesn't, you know, the way Russia sells arms is reinforcing its support for incumbent regimes in the region that sustain their strong security apparatuses and that maintain order. Um, so it's, it's rarely the case that you would say that Russian economic interests or a Russian business trying to make money would um, conflict or go against the sort of Russian security vision for the region. Uh, in the rare instances that this has happened in the past that I can think of, I would say that security trumps economics. So a sort of a, a good example that one could think of is back in 2010, when the Russians had been in talks with the Iranians for quite some time to deliver the S-300. But this was uh, under the time of President Ahmadinejad in Iran. Things were heating up between the Iranians and the Israelis. The US wanted sanctions against Iran and the Security Council, which the Russians ended up supporting. And then the Russians voluntarily decided to put a halt or a ban on the delivery of the S-300. Um, one could say as, as a sort of gesture of goodwill, um, uh, under the, at the time, Medvedev presidency towards the Obama administration during what was a reset in Russia-West relations. 
but also probably realizing that this would, you know, get get you get the Israelis to back off and sort of um, mitigate tensions in the region a little bit. Um, and there were people in Moscow at the time who were unhappy with that decision that the S three hundred was not going to be delivered. So this would be an example where I think security trumped um, making money or doing business. But usually um, the two don't really conflict. The second thing I want to say is um, what this means for Western countries in terms of where we are today with Russian interests in the MENA region. I think Russia has a limited both ability and willingness to compete today with the United States. We'll address this a little bit more tomorrow, but um, the Russians are present in Syria and they are there to stay and they are there to project power into the wider region. But it is not to be expected that Russia will seek that level or that kind of engagement in different in, in other countries or in other conflict files in the region anytime soon. Um, because why would it? Um, and also economically, there's only so much, um, as I try to show, that the Russians can give the region. So, you know, the Americans are to some extent looking to reduce their presence in the region. We've just seen the departure from Afghanistan. There had been talk about the US sort of drawing down from Iraq. And I guess there has been a decision recently to, to um, reduce the level somewhat by the end of the year. But there's no expectation in Moscow that the United States will leave the region and Russia can step in and fill that vacuum, vacuum. nor does Russia want to, I think own the problems that the region uh, poses all by itself. But you know, we, can, we can discuss this if you want. So competition will be, there will be competition, but it will be calibrated and limited. And I think to some extent risk averse, because even though you've seen the Russians and the Americans clash occasionally here and there, for instance, in Northeast Syria, I think there's also, um, a desire on the Russian side to avoid any kind of proper military escalation with Western countries in the Middle East. That's the first thing. At the same time, willingness to cooperate is also limited on the Russian side. And here I put three reasons on this slide. The first I called no bargains. Now, what do I mean by that? I remember back in 2015, being in Moscow when Russia intervened in Syria, and there was this notion among many Russians I spoke with that, you know, by intervening, Russia would create new facts on the ground in Syria and ultimately force the United States to work with Russia on an equal basis um, as a partner, even though that sounded sort of strange to some Westerners who were observing what was going on at the time, but there was a desire still to work together. And this idea that perhaps files in the Middle East could be instrumentalized to get something else done in the broader strategic relationship. I feel if you talk with people in Moscow today, that hope has largely dissipated. Um, you know, I mean, I discuss the Middle East with sort of Russian experts or colleagues fairly regularly, and they usually, they think, okay, maybe you can get something done, a one-off here and there, work together on humanitarian aid, or maybe now with the JCPOA, you know, there's some cooperation going on, but the idea that you could leverage that to address the broader issues um, in Russia's relationship with the West, I, I don't think that um, that is something that people believe in today. Second, there's also institutional momentum, you know, building on the success in Syria and being more active in the region. Some of these interests also become more self-sustaining. Um, the region has become more important to Moscow in its own right. So you'd no longer just see what you're doing through the prism of the relationship with the West and the way that different Russian actors are trying to pursue their own um, interests. Um, is something that we will discuss more tomorrow. And then I think there is a certain degree of self-confidence and defiance. Um, you know, Moscow sees no real need on, on most of these conflict issues. And again, we can go into this in the discussion, Syria, Libya, whatever you're interested in, no real need to adjust its position on these files towards more cooperation with the United States. 
given the, the cost benefit calculation that is currently being made in Moscow, because Russia sees its policy in the region actually as quite successful and sustainable. And at the same time, there's also an expectation in Moscow that whichever way things go, the Middle East and North Africa will no longer be a priority to the current US administration under Biden or to a future US administration because the game is elsewhere. The game is China. So if the Americans are sort of paying less attention to the Middle East anyway, then why would we change doing what we're doing if it sort of seems to be going quite well for us? So I think um, what that means, I guess the bottom line is more of the same. No massive competition or friction, no big cooperation either, um, maybe with the exception of, of the JCPOA, where there seems to be some positive momentum, but certainly on Syria or Libya or any of these conflicts, I don't see a significant Russian-American cooperation um, coming, sort of forthcoming. Maybe I'll end here and um, I'm very happy to discuss and take questions. <laughs>